I've supported Peace One Day for years now. The first reason is because I just believe in the bigger principle of it. It's the most higher order thing you could ever hope for society. From peace, everything good comes. It's how societies can then function. It's how we can tolerate and live together. It's how we can build businesses. It's how we create art. You need peace. It's the fundamental foundation for humanity. So I believe in the, the, the principle of it. And I love the strategic insight of it. Let's just set this goal of having one day. Not every day, just one day. Let's get the world to do it for one day. It's a more achievable ask. It took a great aspiration and made it deliverable. So I love the sort of the vision of it, but I love the strategic possibility of it. And then when I got to engage with the organization and saw the track record of success and how it started from zero and got to be something that the United Nations actually endorsed globally and then became something that was alive on every continent, you just think this is, this is an idea not just whose time has come, but it's an idea who's actually being manifested amongst our generation. I thought that is just something I have to support. So Peace One Day has delivered me every type of possible, brilliant personal experience. Some that you would expect from meeting incredibly powerfully inspiring people that are out in the world negotiating for peace, going into war zones and uh, achieving armistice, uh, the uh, aid workers that are going in and inoculating children or people that are getting child soldiers and rescuing them and getting back to their parents. So meeting some incredibly inspirational people that make you just want to raise your own game in life, that make you personally, me personally, do more to help other people. It's just also give me some brilliantly wonderful fun experiences. Access to amazing music, to Formula One, to travel. I went to the DRC on a tour with um, Peace One Day to see some of the work on the ground in one of the world's most war-torn countries, but also a country that's got this really unfair international reputation for being a country of disease and violence and is actually a country full of beauty and warmth and humanity and Peace One Day was just that portal through which I passed to understand the world has got so much to offer and some of the darkest places in the world have light and we can make them even more light filled by going there and helping and meeting the people and connecting them with uh, the, the wider global community. So it, it's delivered every possible from hedonistic fun to deeply sort of spiritually nourishing to as, aspirational, motivating experiences. I've supported Peace One Day personally, but I also supported Peace One Day through the company I set up, which is a juice company called Innocent Smoothies. And we supported Peace One Day on, oh, over, over several periods of years in, in many different ways. One of the most obvious and practical ways is we launched a Peace One Day smoothie. We couldn't resist the gag. It was made with peaches and raspberries, so it was a peace and raspberry smoothie. And we, we sold that and money went towards Peace One Day from the sales of that. We also and franchised the innocent customer consumer base in Peace One Day by putting it through all our social media channels. We even built a wall of peace so every individual consumer could lay a virtual brick in, in the wall of peace and really tried to use the brand as a way to amplify the peace message and get it out to more people through the packaging, as I say, through all the, the products, through, the, through the, um, our, our social media channels. It also, we just activated a lot internally amongst the employees. Innocent is a company that has at its heart a big dose of altruism. It really is a company for stuff for the people that want to, in whatever way they can, make the world a little bit better than the way that they find it. And Peace One Day was just another way that the business could manifest that commitment. And so we had Peace Day initiatives inside the company as well. So whether it was engaging our retailers or engaging our consumers or engaging our employees, Peace One Day was this fantastic sort of myriad of opportunities to do all of those things.
There's a, there's a strong ethical side to the company. You know, our support of Peace One Day was just one manifestation of that. I mean, why do we do it? Well, we do it for several reasons. One is because we're an independent company set up by three guys, and we care about that kind of stuff. And when it's your own company, if you want to support charity, then you can support charity. Don't have to ask anyone's permission. You just get on with and do it. We also did it because we figured it made the brand richer. It gave an extra reason to buy. The main reason to buy an innocent is because they taste good and do you good. But there is this third benefit that they're doing other people some good too. And that really played strongest amongst the employees because there's just this very, very simple equation that the more that we sell, the more money goes to charity. And that's just a beautiful, virtuous feedback loop. Yes, we're of course we're a business and we're trying to grow to make more money, but that wasn't all we were trying to do. We were trying to get our healthy products, as many people in places as possible, and to raise as much cash for charity as well. So there was always this sort of triple lock of sort of doing it for business reasons, doing it for social reasons, doing it for community reasons. And again, Peace One Day was just the perfect manifestation of that. I would never set up a business that didn't have that as part of the DNA of the company. I mean, let's be clear, we were talking about our commitments, we'd give a minimum of 10% of profits to charity. That's still keeping 90% for ourselves, so I don't want to overstate it, but wow, that 10% that you give to charity, you so get more than that back in terms of employee engagement, employee loyalty, employee work ethic, employee pride. And I think maybe somewhere else out in the sort of the wider world, it, it, it helps consumers engage with the brand a little bit. As I said, no one's buying an innocent smoothie because it raises money for charity. But give them two smoothies to choose from where everything else is equal. They're going to choose the one that's got the charity edge to it. So uh, I always advocate to any business that we invest in, any entrepreneur that I meet, to consider doing the same. Because I think whether you're doing it for the most... Let's face it, esoterical, ethical, spiritual reasons, or for the most hard-edged, capitalist, commercial reasons, you are best served by making sure your business has an ethical edge. You, you just keep brighter people engaged and working harder for longer, and that's how you win in business. It's always about your team, and I think you build a better team and get more from your team if you make sure that doing good is built into the absolute DNA of the whole business structure. Well, this is what I get really excited about. It's about leveraging your power as an employee. Because let's face it, everything that a business does is in response to what its consumers want and what its employees want. And there's really no other sort of prism through which the ultimate business decisions you get made. So people talk about consumer power. I'm a big fan of that. Every time we buy something or don't buy something, we are voting or not voting for that company. So yes, if you don't buy that chocolate bar because it's not made from sustainable sources, in a tiny, tiny way, by not buying that product, you are helping the cause. And if you go and buy a chocolate bar that is made from sustainable sources, then you're making a positive little vote in the right direction. So that's all good. I've got no problem with any of that. We should all buy as ethically as we can. But when you're an employee, you have a thousandfold more significance than an individual consumer's purchase. If you are the employee working in that chocolate company, and you go to your boss with the commercial and the brand arguments for why you should swap as a business to using sustainably sourced chocolate, then suddenly you can have an incredible effect. So I'm not sure that most people really consider that. They think, we think about our influence as consumers, which is there and real, and we should exercise it responsibly. But the chances are, as an employee, you've got a thousand times more potential to affect change than just as a consumer. So it's up to every one of us. I mean, Innocent was 
constantly doing new things. Not because me, Adam and John said, now let's build a sustainable supply chain or now let's move to green electricity or now let's make sure that our vans run on vegetable oil. They were all ideas generated from the team and them saying, not just here's the idea, but I'm going to go do it. A lot of the time, not even asking permission, we just set the mission of we've got to make sure that this business is a business that we can proud of and leaves things better than it finds it. And so then you have 100 people trying to come up with ideas to do that. So yeah, absolutely. That's my biggest pitch as an employee. Think about the, 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 the multiplier effect you can have by getting your business to change the way it does business, not just the things that you buy when you're in the supermarket. Build the case study. Build the economic business rationale for why you should. If you go to your boss with evidence and logic and facts and reasons to why the business as well as society is going to be better served by procuring things differently or choosing green electricity or whatever it is, convince them. Because I'm telling you this, if you can show them the rationale and then they ignore you, then you've just got a dumb boss. And you can go to your boss's boss. Or if it's that serious, if you're really working in a company, that when you go to your boss with a smart idea that's well thought through, that's got logic and reason behind it of why it's better for the business and better for the environment to do this new thing, and they don't do it, then just get yourself to a better company. Come to Innocent. We love all that kind of stuff. But these days, most businesses want to do better because... Human beings know that we need to. But my ask is, if you're really serious about changing the world, it's not just enough to go to your boss full of passion and, oh, I want to do this, I want to do this. Give them the logic and the facts and the reasons. Be hardcore about it. Show the commercial brand benefit, the employee, engage, the employee engagement benefit. Give them a business reason to make the business change. That's how we save the planet, is by being... By using capitalism, all the principles of chasing profit and increasing market size and having more employee engagement, use all those things that all businesses want to affect the change that we need to see. Don't do stuff expecting people to ignore those things. A business is always going to need to grow. It's always going to need to make money. But it's always, most importantly, going to have to keep its consumers and employees engaged. So build the case for why you should make the change. The globalization of commerce, whilst of course causing some issues, fundamentally is getting the world to stitch together more closely and build a, a, a peaceful planet. Because apart from, unless you're selling guns and bullets, we all make more money out of peace. Yes, of course, the arms people would love a nice big war because then they get to sell loads of stuff but everyone else is bad for business so no the, this is what i think is misunderstood about you know, sort of the, the the brighter side of capitalism what it's really doing is getting human beings to to tolerate and work with one another even just when you look at the multinational corporations that the, they've been running proactively ethnic, ethnically diverse workplaces for a long period of time now. The, the, the first sort of vanguard for gender equality. So there's all these like intangible but fundamental benefits that come from businesses trading with one another. It's, it's why I was so depressed about the referendum result in the EU because the EU was set up absolutely to retain the peace after World War II based on the insight that countries that trade with one another don't fight with one another. So this idea of, you know, if we can all just positively build stuff together, then we all will benefit. We have to, of course, manage the downsides, the environmental costs of, of an ever, you know, globalized trading planet, but humanity is best served through it. The greatest future we can all have is if we share it. If we tr keep trying to just grasp a future for individually ourselves, then that's when 
the world fragments and atomizes, and then everyone starts to fight one another. If we've got a collaborative approach, which business has as a de default position, the business is a team sport. You, you, you get buy, buy some of your stuff, you buy some of my stuff, we work together, then everyone wins. So, yeah, no, I, 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 long term, the bigger picture, I see globalization, capitalism, commercialism, these words that are seen as a bit dirty, fundamentally, they're driving a planet which wants to cooperate with itself. And that's really exciting. But that's why we need peace. Peace is the most taken for granted thing. And it, it's not the norm. Peace is not the norm. It should be and it can be and it will be in the future. But you know, we have to work at it. And business is a great way to start laying those foundations. So the book is called If I Could Tell You Just One Thing, and it's based on encounters with 60 remarkable people and me asking them, given everything they've done in life, given anything that's happened to them, given everything that they now know or believe to be true, if they could only pass on one piece of advice to the next generation, what would that be? And all of the money that the book raises, 100% of the you know, author's profits go to charity to help social inclusion and mentoring charities. It's essentially what I'm trying to do is capture and pull down the wisdom of our age from exceptional people and make it available to all, a kind of global commons of advice. And so the people in question, it's people that have, as I said, have either done something remarkable, something remarkable has happened to them. Uh, people like President Clinton from politics, uh, Mike Bloomberg from business, Marina Abramovich from the world of art, Joanna Lam Lumley, the British actress who's been a massive campaigner for huge social initiatives, but also people that you won't have heard of. Um, an Afghan vet that had three of his limbs blown off when he was 10 days from the end of his tour of duty, a woman that had acid thrown in her face by a... Well, by a complete idiot ex-boyfriend, an Auschwitz survivor. So people that have been through the fire as well as through the light, you know, there's, it, it's, it's trying to walk the full gamut of human emotion. And I mean, what have I heard? Um, now, I've heard some fundamentally powerful things. Um, I guess my favourite bit of advice was um, from actually a woman who's the number one sort of relationship therapist in the world, a woman called Esther Perel, and she just said, look, you know, the, the, it is a fundamental truth of life that your quality of life as a human being, the single biggest determinant of your quality of life, in terms of how you can live and enjoy your life the most, is the quality of your relationships, how much you invest in your friends and family and who they are and what you do for them. And that's how you're going to be remembered at the end of the life, is how were you as a person to the people that you know and love? Were you generous? Were you caring? It related, and another bit of advice I was given is think about who you want to be, not in nouns, but in adjectives. People think, oh, I want to be a footballer, or I want to be a business person. But what if you described your aspirations for yourself in adjectives? What adjectives would you choose as the person that you'd want to be? Maybe you'd be warm and caring, or funny, or adventurous, or kind, or curious, or intellectual. You know, so, Think of the person you want to be in terms of adjectives and think of how you are in relation to other people. And I think they are sort of, I found them sort of very simple but powerful ways to think about how to build for you the best possible life. And then I had some brilliantly terrible bits of advice as well. Like my favourite bad bit of advice was this deeply impressive and to be hugely respected international businesswoman whose advice was never take holidays. And I thought, that's not my kind of advice. But she said, honestly, when you get to my age, she was like 10 years older than me, she's not even that old, she said, you'll regret taking holidays. You should take maybe a day, a day and a half off a year, and the rest of the time you should be working. I just thought, no, nah. <laughs> not for me. <laughs> As I sat on the beach in Ibiza, thinking, <laughs> no, <laughs> next. <laughs>
Yeah, of course art plays a role in building a more sustainable, peaceful world. It plays a... What does art really do? It sort of... It, it captures ourselves, our, hum, our shared humanity. And that's what I love about art. It can be extremely cohesive. It can at least allow us to have some shared experience where we stand in front of something and go, huh. And it shows that we're all essentially the same. We get caught up with who was born here and who was born there and what do they look like and what colour their skins. We're just the same, right? We're just a funny little species that we all kind of want the same stuff, which is to hang out with our friends and families and to have some nice hobbies and, you know, just sort of try and do the best for, for ourselves in life and the people around us. And art, I think, good art can remind us of that, that we are essentially the same species and all the little, all the things that cause the friction points are insignificant. They're sort of tiny little details in the general scheme of things. So, yeah, I mean, I got involved in a project called Art Everywhere, which was about putting art on the billboards of up and down the country. And it was just... It was just great because you could be someone who's never hadn't got a qualification to their name or you can be some very well-educated, highfalutin, sort of high-powered person. You stand in front of a beautiful picture. You can just have, if not the same experience, an equally valid experience. You know, what do you think? Oh, I think this. What do you think? I think that. And no one's right and no one's wrong with art. That's what I love about it. No one's right and no one's wrong. It's how you feel in relation to it. No one's feelings are superior or inferior to someone else's. It's a personal thing that we can all share. Well, I would say join in. Join in the, the, the biggest most fundamental, most beautiful, most fun, most lovely, fastest growing global event is Peace Day. It's the day where we just say, okay, for today, we're not gonna talk about yesterday or tomorrow. Let's just deal with today. We're gonna make amends. We're gonna say sorry. We're gonna reach out. We're gonna give a hug. We're not gonna bully. We're gonna have a football match instead, or we're gonna dance or listen to some music or, go to a gig. We're just going to just give all our respective selves a break, a bit of slack, the benefit of the doubt. How, how can that be bad for anyone? It's something that is universally good for every person on the planet. There's not many things you can claim that of, but peace is one of those things. And we've got momentum. We just need more people to join. But by you joining and asking your friends to join, that's how this thing really begins to happen. And then once we've got the day as a truly all seven billion of us observing event where the guns are put down and the violence doesn't happen and we have a day of reflection and sort of, as I say, building bridges, from that day then maybe there'll be a second day. And then from that second day maybe there'll be a third day and you can see how one day where it ends. And the sooner people get involved, the closer we, and the sooner we get to that point. So on Peace Day this year, I am involved in a, well, it'll be one of a 30 day charity challenge that I'm involved in where we have to get from, uh, the Matterhorn in Switzerland to Mount Etna, which is the volcano in Sicily under human power. So we have to run 90 kilometers, cycle 2,000 kilometers, swim three kilometers, um, mountain bike 100 kilometers, and then run up the volcano. So you, you'll find me, <laughs> in theory, halfway through that. So I will be sweating for peace this year.